don't know if this is working out. Our scripture today is from Luke 22, 7 through 20. Then came the day of the unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. So they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you, carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There make ready. So they went and found it, just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Amen. Thank you, Roxanne. Well, we're here this morning, like I just mentioned earlier, uh, wrapping up our our final week before our bonus section of our our, uh, Christian Eve series. But I want to take a second before we get started talking about communion and just to share this. I have had some conversations uh, with some of you and some others that were asking about what the Christian E series was about uh, at work, and and <clears throat> I want to make sure that it's it's understood that we're not saying these are terminology that you have to use. Okay, this isn't something that you have to use. But like in any workplace, any career, any field that you're in, any sport has its own kind of terminology that develops. Right? That's really just intentional on that, that you really don't use anywhere else, um, or you don't use it in the same manner. And a lot of these words and terminologies we don't use in our everyday life outside of our, our faith, and that's fine. Um, I, I do want to share this as well. When we, we're sharing our faith, um, we, th- we often think that we have to come up with some fancy words and the right thing to say, Right? That we feel like we got it, like it's up to us to convince them to come to Jesus, right? Uh, Newsflash: It's not up to us. Okay, God just uses us as a tool. God does the work. Okay, and we're the tool that's doing the work. So all we have to do is do the work. We don't have to worry about this and necessarily the specifics and, and fretting over that. Um, it's good to be prepared, but it's not something that we have to feel like it's up to us. Okay, and these these terminologies and these words are just words that we kind of use in our church world, and it's okay if you don't use it, um, but it's important to know, right? It's important to really understand what it is. It's important to understand what sanctification is, not that you have to say, God, help me be sanctified today, right? Help me become more holy. We, you know, we may not use those words, but it's, under, it's important to understand what those those words mean and how they really apply to our faith, right, and how they impact our faith. Today's communion, and uh, oftentimes we kind of can overlook communion, but uh, I just want to take a second to pray over this time and uh, just uh, to kind of prepare our hearts for what God wants to, wants you to hear and wants me to, me to say, okay? God, we thank you. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity you've given me to share today. I thank you for the words you've given me, and I thank you for using me, God. God, in our room this morning, we have people that uh, have grown up taking communion, taking communion in different beliefs and faiths. God, people who've who've uh, done studies on communion, people who maybe just kind of not even sure what it means, God. God, my prayer is that this morning, as, as you use my words, God, that you would just speak to their hearts where they're at and that they uh, may find meaning and purpose uh, throughout this morning. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. So, Roxanne read uh, the Last Supper. Jesus, Jesus was with his, his guys, his crew, 
and uh, having, a, having a Passover meal with the disciples. Now, as we talk about communion, I think it's important to kind of back up some and talk about where communion came from and, and where the Last Supper was. But in order to do that, we kind of need to talk about what Jesus was doing that night. He was there celebrating the Passover and having a meal with his disciples. The Passover, I think we need to ask that question first, right? What's the Passover meal? What, what was its intent, its, its purpose, and why, why were they doing that then? And then why don't we celebrate that now as, as believers in Christ? Passover meal was like a sacred feast, the most sacred feast and celebration that the Jewish uh, religion had each year. It comm- commemorated the final plague that God placed down on the Egyptians, okay? So there were all these plagues uh, that God, God gave the Pharaoh a chance to repent and turn, and he didn't, so he, he told Moses to tell the Pharaoh, that, well, you're going to have some bad luck coming your way, right? Some, um, some bad things. The final one was this, that every, Egypt, uh, every firstborn in Egypt uh, would die. And so for the Jewish people that were enslaved by the Egyptians, for them to be passed by and not lose their firstborn, they, God told them to uh, take the blood of a lamb and sprinkle it on their doorposts, their, their front door, so that when they were coming through town, that it would, it would pass them, okay? So it doesn't just stop there, right? God goes on and says, take that lamb and roast it and uh, eat it with unleavened bread. So that's where the feast became. That's kind of how it started. Um, God commands them throughout the generations to, to come to the feast and celebrate that Passover. I mean, you know, we like to think about all this terminology and things and looking into things, but how simple was Passover, remembering what the Passover was about? It passed over us, right? It passed by us. It didn't cause us. So very simple explanation there of, to remember. And in, in Exodus, uh, Exodus 12 really does a good job of explaining that. I'd encourage you this week to kind of go by because uh, that's really uh, a powerful story to kind of reflect on and remember and remember how similar it is to the Last Supper and how we started communion from there, and how it's that new covenant. So during the last summer, uh, supper, they were together sharing the meal, the Passover celebration, remembering that God spared them their firstborns as that final plague, which allowed them to escape Egypt, right, and, and have uh, that freedom. And then they mess it up for a little while there afterwards, don't they, just for a little bit. But Jesus took that bread at that last supper, and he gave thanks as, as Roxanne was reading, and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, right? And what Roxanne read said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is why he's explaining communion to us. In the same way, he took the cup at the end of supper and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. He's making a new promise to us, saying here's the new deal I've got with you. So he concludes the feast, if you look at Matthew, by singing a hymn. And they go out to the Mount of Olives, different area, and he goes to pray. And that's where he's betrayed. So he has supper. It's dark. He goes out. He's praying. He gets betrayed. Judas betrays him, hands him over to the Romans. And that was literally his last supper. So sometimes we make things complicated, right? Super detailed communion. We call it the Last Supper because it was Jesus' last supper here on earth. Um, I'm kind of a simple man, a simple word, so I love this, like Passover, passes over, Last Supper, Jesus' Last Supper. It makes sense to me. I can follow this stuff. I, that's my level of thinking there. But um, we go on, and uh, uh, after that, Jesus betrays him, right, that night, and he's, he's crucified. Paul... If you'll remember, Paul was Saul before uh, Jesus got to him. Paul was a, a rough man, and uh, he was not uh, very very supportive of Christians. He killed Christians and had them murdered. He was he was uh, he's kind of an extremist. He's either completely against believing in Christ, and then completely sold out for Christ. Like there was no middle ground for Paul. I can kind of see Paul as somebody that's intense about everything that he does because he's so committed. He probably just wears his heart on his sleeve and so passionate. 
But Paul talks to the church of Corinth in uh, 1 Corinthians. We're going to read it in just a second, 11, uh, 27 through 29. Before what I'm about to read, he rips the church of Corinthians, saying, you got it all wrong. He, I mean, he, he's speaking truth to him. He's not holding back in his letter. And then he goes on to say this, and it's not found in the Gospels. Paul writes this here. It says, so then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. So sometimes we, can, we like to play with words, and in an unworthy manner has a lot of flexibility for us to play with and convince ourselves we're not in an unworthy manner, right? Like we didn't come up here uh, using the Lord's name in vain as we're taking communion, so that's not unworthy manners. We didn't do that, so we can, we can kind of justify what that means. But I really think what Paul means here is uh, a couple of things. Simply just disregard the meaning of the bread and cup. Or maybe, like, forget the tremendous price Jesus paid for us, right? That would be disregarding that meaning. When we, we go and we take communion and we forget and we just kind of push to the side that uh, the price that Jesus really had to pay for us, as we, we take and remember, we ought to really reflect on what Jesus really did for us and the suffering he did and the sacrifice God, God gave us. I think the other side of it might mean this, to allow just the ceremony of communion to become dead or just a formal ritual. And I, I want to take ownership of this. I feel like as a church and our leadership, you know, at times we just, we end up making it, we don't spend enough time thinking about how can we set a time aside for, for Revive Community Church to really mean this that it's not a ritual that we've done the same time once a month or however often we do it. But it can be a scary place when you just make something a ritual, right? It can be a scary spot that we find ourselves in where you're doing something and you don't even realize it, like uh, maybe when you drive to Owensboro or Tell City or to work or wherever you find yourself, and like 10 minutes later you realize you have no clue how you got from there to 10 minutes ago. Remember, you know, those times where you're like, man, I I zoned out. I'm on this road all the time, every single day. It's so routine, I could probably close my eyes and get a pretty good idea of when I need to turn, just based off my timing. That can be a scary spot when you do that, isn't it? It Like, if we actually did that in the car, it would be pretty risky. I think it's the same thing here in in our ritual that we make of communion and taking the bread in the cup and we can become very ritualistic in that and find ourselves just going through the motions, just like we drive to work. Either way, we need to examine our, ourselves before we eat the bread and drink the cup, really reflecting on why are we doing this instead of just going through the motions. Paul also says this in another statement that's not included in the gospel. It's 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. It says, for whoever... Uh, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I think it's important to understand that communion is about now. It's about now. There is going to be an end where we don't take communion anymore, right? When he returns, when Jesus returns, we won't take it anymore. We'll get to, We'll have a new covenant, a new celebration, right? A new purpose behind that. But until he comes, God's called us to do this and to do it in remembrance of his son. So I think back to the purpose of communion. Now, we've kind of talked about it some, but the the history and understanding the Passover and now Jesus had the Last Supper. See, I don't think it's a coincidence that Jesus took two of the frailest elements that could be used and represented his body and his blood. See, that's the monument to his death, bread and juice. You know, he doesn't have a big tower that he wanted us to come worship to or a big synagogue or a big palace. 
or a big statue that he wants us to come worship and he had built before he died or said, go build this after I die. Just saying, take what you have every single day, food, drink, and use that to remember me. It's not out of gold or marble. It's something very, very easy. We think about communion a lot and what it should be. As I've been reflecting this week, at least, I've been thinking about it a lot. I think it's important to remember what it's not. It's not the ritual that we go through. The motion just making, hoping something magical is going to happen through it, right? It's not a ritual where we think that we believe that this is actually the body and blood of Jesus somehow reincarnated to us that we're eating. That's kind of like Justin shared last week and uh, around Halloween. That would be gross if that's really blood we're drinking, right? Or really, you know, Jesus' body. That, that's weird. That's uncommon. And, uh, but it does represent something, doesn't it? It's also not somehow magically going to turn into that. See, communion is not just a Sunday thing. We take it on Sundays, but it's not just a Sunday thing. When's the last time, just a rhetorical question, you don't have to answer. When's the last time you prayed over a meal? Right? Why do we do that? God calls us to do it, right? Every time we have bread and juice, to do it and remember him. We could do this three times a day. Some of you that eat six times a day, you know, the hungry ones like myself. We could do that six times a day, stop and reflect, right? There's a purpose behind that Jesus chose the bread and juice, I believe. Scripture says to do it in remembrance of him. Jesus says to do it in remembrance of me. Now, I don't know about remembrance, but uh, talking about praying over meals and forgetting to do that at times, right? Or all the time forgetting, maybe. We're just bad at remembering, aren't we? Or we have great short-term memory. Our long-term memory is getting, I think, worse and worse by, by the moment here. Like, think about, I'll just, I'm going to pull my phone out because I really want to tell you how many here. Uh, I'm doing really well right now. I only have five reminders to-do list right now on my app. Usually it's like 15 or 20. And, like, they pop up and scroll up, and I've got, like, 10 that I'm way behind on that I didn't do this week that I was supposed to do last week. It's because I forget all the time. And some of you uh, set reminders on your phone. Some of you set uh, alarms on your phone to go off at a certain time so you remember to take medicine or do this or that, right? Because we forget. You know, back in the day, uh, before my time, some of you all in here might remember this, tying a string to your finger. So you don't forget something? You remember you got to do something? Remember that old uh, thing that I remember grandparents used to talk about some? We do all kinds of things to re- try to remember what to do. The Passover celebration was to do what? Remember what God had freed them from, right? It was simply to remember what God had done for them. Like, you got to do this every single year because I know you all. And you're going to forget. So do it every single year. I also think in just other ways. Remembering those that have gone before us, those that have died, those that, people that have had an impact on our lives, <clears throat> things we do for loved ones to remember them or honor them. Think about some ways. Share, share out loud. What are some ways that you remember those that have gone before you? that have made an impact on your life? Just share it. Yell it out. Don't scream it out. Just yell it out. Tattoo. Tattoo. Yeah. Tattoos. I was actually talking to Katie this morning about her tattoos. She's got a tattoo of her flower, a, a special kind of lily that was named after her dad because her family had a, a flower farm. I don't remember the exact details of, of it all. You'll have to explain it to her, but I asked her if I could share it. Uh, and her dad loved driving by and seeing the wildflowers on the side. So she got a tattoo to remember her dad and to honor her dad. What else? The impact. Just thinking about the impact they made on you. Who you are today, maybe. 
flowers on the gravesite. We do that all kinds of times, but uh, maybe at at the uh, an- death anniversary or on Mother's or Father's Day or on their birthday, right? We think about that and reflect. What else? Telling stories, you know, getting around other people that know that person, right, and just sharing stories, or maybe just wanting to tell somebody else that doesn't know him or know her. I think the greatest, one of the greatest things that we have now that uh, are the uh, Facebook anniversaries. On this day, five years ago or a year ago, right, we can reflect back and, and see what other people posted or maybe what we posted about somebody else. That's actually a, a benefit. It helps us remember what's happened in the past, doesn't it? Think of anything else? Put pictures around, don't we, of loved ones? Um, back when uh, my pep old John passed away, um, I was living in Louisville at the time, and uh, <laughs> I hadn't run since college. When I when I quit baseball, I stopped working out. And so that was probably like eight or ten years, maybe after after college. And uh, uh, he passed away, and I randomly randomly decided I was going to run a 5K in honor of him, uh, and. Uh, I'm glad I did. It really overcame a lot, and I just, I don't know why I did it. I felt led to, but uh, that was a way I I wanted to honor him. I also uh, think about items that we have. I brought some today of items that we have from loved ones, right? <clears throat> I've got in this box here a couple of tie tacks that were from my pep all, and uh, he wore these. And so anytime I put a tie on, thankfully it's not very often, uh, but anytime I put a tie on, I remember that. I, I like as I'm putting the tie and I'm tying the tie. Like I have that time. Sometimes the kids are running around or I'm doing the extra things. But in that moment, I can still reflect back and I'm I'm visually picturing his face and and uh, me running around his house and uh, us spending the night over there and doing silly things to to get them to laugh and and cut up and and him eating his vanilla wafers. I just reflect on everything he who he was, how he built me up. A truck, a little a toy truck before he passed away. Uh, I have a knife here of my other pepal. And uh, I think back to, to him. And uh, he was a surveyor. And so I got to actually spend a couple summers surveying with him. And so I think back to all the silly things we did and just his quirky personality and dry sense of humor and how much fun we had uh, back there and how meticulous he was over details. Like, I reflect back on this because I have some things that they used to have. Um, my, my, um, one of my grandmas, uh, we called her Me Mama. Many of you all know her. She wrote a letter. Now, I was reading this again last night. I think I was supposed to read this when I was like 55. It was one of those time things. Uh, but uh, uh, this is really cool. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time, but I want to just kind of share a minute of this here. She wrote me a whole letter. Now, I wasn't very old when she wrote this, so she like, said something about, I remember how you were always so loving and caring and accept me, even though I'm your step-grandma, you accept me. I'm like, well, me, Mama, I was nine. I didn't know the difference, you know? But, uh, but uh, she wrote some things down here, and guess what she wrote it on? My pep all surveying stuff, right? Again, another reminder of who he was and how hard he worked. So I can reflect back on this, and they put, like, um, uh, prices of different things in here she put, put in there. But she also talked about how much she loved me and how loving I was and how much she loved spending time with me. Again, just a simple reminder, right, of, of who she was and how, how caring she was and how giving she was. We have these, these reminders throughout life of, of all different kinds of uh, of ways through things that we have on us, uh, things that we have in our house, things that we carry in our pockets, right? All these different reminders of people that have gone before us. I think sometimes we forget about communion. It's that simple thing. Remembering what Jesus did for us. Remembering who he is. Remembering though I've had a bad week and I feel like God's not here, I can remember what he did. I know he's here. I know he cares about me even though I don't hear him. 
because he paid the price on the cross, right? I can remember his character because I take time three times a day to pray over my meal and thank God for what he's done and, and how he's blessed me and how he's used me. See, um, in the Old Testament, Joshua, uh, under Joshua's leadership, God's uh, people had a history of forgetting. And they're frustrated and they've gotten mad. Joshua takes over leadership and had them lay stone altars uh, by taking stones and putting them in a prominent place so that they, at an intersection or a, a place they walk by so that they could remember, so that somebody could ask, what in the world are those stones there for? Why is that big rock pile there? And that they could share a story. See, there, this communion time, the rocks altar, the, the Passover, isn't just about us, right? It's about us. It's about us sharing the story as well. See, there are so many people that aren't in this room today, right? They're, they're across the street or they're down the road or they're not at a church today. They don't have a relationship with Christ. They need to hear the story. They need to, to sit down and pray over a meal with you and you to say, thank you, God, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for providing this food for me. They need to hear these things. Today, we have all kinds of symbols that can remind us of crosses that we wear and and, and all different other ways that we have to remember them. But one of the primary intentions of communion is so that we remember. The biggest reason is so that we, we remember the greatest thing that anyone has ever done for us, which is give up his son so that we can be forgiven and have an opportunity to eternal life. I want to share this with you. If you want to close your eyes, you can. You don't have to. But just really reflect on this as we close out here. Jesus gets together on his last night with his friends, and he tells them that my body is going to be broken for you. My blood is going to be spilled out for you. Think about that news, that reflection of knowing somebody you really care about and you look up to. He's telling them what it's going to be like. And then he goes on and says, so when you break bread together, I want you to remember my body was broken for you. He takes the cup, says, I want you to remember my blood was shed for you because this is what the forgiveness is coming from. This is how you're going to be forgiven. I got to imagine there's an intense moment at that time in that room where they're really sinking in saying, this is really going to happen. And some of them are saying, thinking maybe it's going to happen down the road. Some of them are thinking, yeah, okay. Maybe not quite getting it. Maybe not really reflecting. And others are thinking, this is really going to happen. And then he says this, I want you to do exactly what we did tonight in remembrance of me. He doesn't give us a time frame. He just says, do it as often as you do it in remembrance of me. This is the most amazing thing that anyone can do for you. Can you imagine just God kind of, Jesus sharing that with his disciples? It's like, this is the most amazing thing that anybody can do for you. Greater love than this. No greater love than this. Then someone lays down his life for you. And I don't want you to forget it. So every time you break the bread, remember my body. Every time you drink, remember my blood that was shed for you. It's just about remembering. And do this to proclaim my death and resurrection until my return. We're going to take communion here in a minute, but I just want to give you a chance to reflect and, and worship. So um, let's stand and let's sing.